So this is going to talk about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And I'll just read the slides. So there is no other study quite like it. It was not even originally a social psychology study. In fact, it didn't have anything to do with psychology at all. It started as a weight loss study in the late 1980s. The researchers wanted to know why participants were doing well in the weight loss program, but then eventually dropped out, quit, or put back on all their weight. It took a while for people to start accepting the results, but now there are at least 100,000 spin-off studies that support its conclusion. So this is one of the biggest studies that, if you haven't heard about it, um, it's, it's picking up a tidal wave of momentum. So I, I felt like I needed to make sure that you all had this information. This is the newest emerg emerging discovery that does more to explain the state of our society, the state of people, and, and, it, and most of what we learned and talked about this semester. It has finally gained enough traction over the past 10 years that it is influencing policy and the medical field, which is who originally researched the information. And the original researchers were both doctors. <clears throat> all fields of psychology, all fields of science, that is, neuroscience, genetics, epigenetics, epidemiology, all disciplines of psychology, endocrinology, oncology, cardiology, are now paying attention to the findings of this study that we're talking about right here. Some of you are going into social work and psychology, so this information will be invaluable. I predict with the momentum, the undeniable truth, and the findings of subsequent emerging developments, that this study will eventually impact each one of us in our day-to-day -day lives. <clears throat> so what is the ACE study? Well, it was originally conducted by doctors uh, looking at weight loss, and they were trying to take people down uh, by fasting. They uh, just gave them uh, liquids and vitamins and no food, and they you're able to keep people alive like that. After researchers noticed uh, success, followed by relapse and a regain of weight in a lot of participants, a series of interviews revealed a, a recurring theme. Most of them had experienced significant childhood trauma. So uh, they said, we've got to do something. We've got to find out more. The, in conjunction with the CDC and uh, an insurance company, researchers sent a survey out to 25,000 people research, uh, receiving this insurance and because it was involved with their health insurance they received 17,500 surveys back so there's a lot of data um, when you're looking at uh, you know getting a drug approved for the FDA you're only looking at maybe 1,000 2,000 participants this study had 17,500 the researchers were shocked by their results and they have reverberated throughout the various fields of science ever since this is the actual survey. So there were, uh, there were actually over 100 questions, but these were mixed in, uh, and they found that these were the 10 most influential and predictive. So if you, if you go down, you'll notice that the questions involve pretty heavy-handed uh, situations, uh, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, uh, physical neglect, emotional neglect, a divorce that, that impacts over 50% of us now. Uh, domestic violence uh, was, was your, a parent an addict or an alcoholic? Did a parent suffer from mental illness? And did, did a household member go to prison? And so, if you add all these up, if if you read those questions and uh, you you answer either yes, no, it's very simple. So you add up all those scores, you add up the total number of yeses, and that's your ACE score. So what does all this information mean? What, what, so it's looking at adverse childhood experiences. What, what does this mean? What did, well, if you look back, what did all the events have in common? They all involved parents. And in each event, a primary rela relationship was broken with children. So you might ask, well, how does this impact future relationships? How does this affect development? How does this affect future psychological and physical health? That's what the studies have focused on afterwards, after this initial study. And so, um, you know, they were able to follow these people uh, because they have their health records. So they were able to follow these people throughout their lives. And so the average age of participant was actually 57. This is what they found in those 17,500 people. If you have four more ACEs, uh, you're 500, uh, actually about 58% of females uh, 
tend to develop depression, and 35% of males. The, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you have horrible experience as a child, you're probably going to be depressed. But look at the stair step. Look at, you know, if you have one ace, you have a 20% chance, two ace, 35%, three ace, 40%, four or more, a 58% chance. You know, 58% of people uh, become depressed. Uh, and you would think, well, that's also related to suicide. Uh, suicide attempts under, you know, uh, these are looking at suicide attempts versus the number of aces. So with four or more, about, you know, 20% of people uh, attempt suicide. 20% of those people having four or more. So it's it's kind of like when they first saw this, it's like this, the, the smoking studies where, you know, they looked at the number of uh, packs of cigarettes a person would smoke and, you know, that increases the risk of cancer, just just like we're seeing here, that these are increasing the risk of developing these things. So the risk of becoming a victim of domestic violence, again, with each category of ACE, you, especially for women, that risk goes up. Perpetrating domestic violence, again, don't you, you know, you're going to be, it's like you're going to be a violent person. The more ACEs that you have, the more adverse experiences that you have as a child. And we ask about what, what happens with relationships. Well, look at the failed marriages. I mean, uh, this is increased risk. So you have a 400% greater chance of getting a divorce, uh, almost a 600% greater chance of having 50 or more sexual partners, a 500% greater chance of, of being uh, uh, the victim of domestic violence. Um, look at, you know, some of those questions had to do with, with sexual abuse and neglect. And so look at teen sexual behaviors. Intercourse by 15, about 30 to 25 percent. Teen pregnancy, over 40 percent. That same study was replicated here in the ENA campus this year, and the results were exactly the same. Teen paternity, uh, 35 percent of the people that had four or more uh, end up getting someone pregnant. Uh, the likelihood of being raped increases as well. Over over 30 percent of people that had four or more reported being raped, whereas if you had zero, that's under 5 percent. Substance use disorders, this is increased risk. The four or more category, you have 1,100% greater chance of becoming an IV drug user with four or more. Alcoholism, the same thing. Uh, you know, 16% of people became alcoholics with four or more of these. A score, and so you look at the effects on society. Think about the, you know, the, the, the drug use. Think about the A score and indicators of impaired worker performance. And so you look at absenteeism goes up, serious financial problems go up, serious job problems. I mean, these are these are predictors of what happens. So when you're thinking about things like, uh, you know, situational versus dispositional attribution, remember our fundamental attribution error at the very beginning of this the semester, where people say it's just because they're lazy, it's just because they just can't get it together. It's this internal problem with them. What does this say versus internal versus external? What is this telling us? Is it situational? Is it dispositional? A score in relation to homelessness, adult homelessness. Folks that have eight or more, again, the stair step, the increased risk with each added ACE, each added adverse childhood experience causes these problems. Chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease. Again, you have about 18% of people versus only 7% of people that don't have any uh, of, of these adverse childhood experiences. It's actually the most common, these ACEs are, are the leading predictor of the 10 most common causes of death in the United States. So you look at lung disease, 390% uh, three, greater risk, 220% greater risk of heart disease, 190% a, a, a greater risk of any cancer, 160% a, a greater risk of diabetes, And so here's what happens. So you have adverse childhood experiences at the bottom of this. You have disrupted development, social, cognitive, emotional impairment, health risk behaviors, then you have disease, disability, and social problems, and early death. People who have six or more tend to lead lives that uh, end 20 years before their counterparts with zero. ACEs are predictive of early death, 20 years, 20 years shorter of people that have six or more. So what happens? What happens? Why? Why is this happening? 
Well, the research has come together, and it, what's happening is this chronic, this thing called chronic stress, and our body creates too much cortisol if you're in a state of basically constant fight versus flight. And so when you have too much cortisol, uh, it impacts neural development. It's actually neurotoxic. So if you go to the doctor and you get a shot of cortisone or, or a steroid shot because you know, you're, you've got inflammation, cortisol is good in the short run, but the more that we have it, you can't take steroid shots every day because it's horribly detrimental for our body. It wears and tears tremendously. And so you can actually see areas of the brain that are smaller because the, the increased levels of cortisol have damage. They've been able to show this uh, using the, the magnetic imagery of the brain uh, and been able to go through and understand this in, in a very good way in the past 20 years. This is this has exploded into, wow, this is what explains what's going on. There is nothing more predictive that I know about to explain what's going on in the world than this study. Uh, your, your hippocampus is smaller, the, the area of the brain that's responsible for making memories. The amygdala, which is responsible for helping us regulate our emotion, it's smaller. Our prefrontal cortex, which is our highest thinking as humans, it's smaller. Our, uh, our cerebellar vermis, which helps us even you know, co to coordinate our, our, our movements, it's smaller. Chronic stress, cortisol, basically kills our brain cells. It's horrible. And I have some links up there. I have a link on this page if you want to look at it. So how do we make a difference? Some of you may be thinking, well, wow, that's, that's me. You know, I find myself two or three times on, uh, you know, my ACE score is two or three. So what do you do? What do you do with that? How do we make a difference? Um, both with ourselves and with others, because this is, and so when I first heard this, I mean, I was like in a tailspin. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, what, what happens? And so it's like so depressing and almost morbid to think about, but there are things that we can do. And so this is what our discussion is going to focus on. So if this is the first time you've heard this, it, you know, don't like complete, oh my gosh, I've, I'm, I'm at a four, I'm at a six. What's, what's going to happen to me? If, if you notice there are symptoms of you constantly being stressed, constantly de fighting depression, there are things to do. And there are things that can mitigate and help your, your brain and your body uh, be resilient through these things. And, and so here's some attributes of resilience. Uh, so, you know, social competence, being able to, you know, make friends, be, be uh, socially active, healthy. Uh, problem solving skills, you know, how able are you to kind of step through and manage the problems that come up. Autonomy, having a sense that you yourself can make a difference, that you can influence your future. And then also having a sense of purpose in the future, you know, having future goals. These things help a person bend but not break. And there's also things that we can do as a society. There are things that we can do as people to help, especially others that have been through this. Uh, effective parents and caregivers, the number one, the number one factor in resilience. Uh, you will have a good outcome if you just have one caring, compassionate adult that's there through thick and thin. Connections to other competent and caring adults, pro-social competent peers, counseling comes in here, problem-solving skills, self-regulation skills, positive beliefs about the self, you know, good self-esteem, belief that life has meaning, you know, faith, spirituality, uh, economic advantages down on the list, but it's still there. Effective schools and teachers and safe, effective communities. Those things we can do to help build resilience. And so there are also some therapies, and, and especially the research has emerged along with this study that's showing that mindfulness, uh, meditation, ways of decreasing stress, even just exercise, um, you know, being involved with other people, being socially active, but particularly for those of you that are going through chronic stress, that are going through depression, the, the research has emerged that really heavily supports uh, things like uh, mindfulness meditation, things like yoga. I've got some links right there if you just want to see, you know, what it is. Other type of therapies would be like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, prolonged exposure therapy for adults. Uh, EMDR is very effective for folks that have, you know, distressing dreams and memories. Uh, all of these things have been shown to help. So I want you to focus on those for this week's discussion. I've really appreciated everybody in this class. I look forward to seeing your responses here, and uh, I will come back later with instructions for our final. See you.